Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missing mom of five from New Canaan. The girlfriend in the middle of a bitter and brutal divorce battle. The stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer. It belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high profile murder investigation. Guys, what happened to Jennifer McGregor? We're taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again for Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. I'm Shannon Miller. We are preparing for day 17 in the trial. As you take a look here at Stanford Superior Court, it's a new week of testimony for the jury who have already heard so much about this case. So let's take a look back of some of the key moments in the trial so far. On day one, we saw the initial response the night Jennifer Dulos was reported missing. Body camera video shows New Canaan police officers going through her Wells Lane home with flashlights going room by room for ending up in the garage where they're recorded on that body worn video noting what appear to be blood like stains and substances on and around Jennifer's Range Rover. Early on, the jury heard a gripping testimony from the Dulos nanny, Lauren Almeida. She went through the breakdown of their marriage, the contentious divorce proceedings, and the moment she knew something was terribly wrong when Jennifer didn't answer her calls or text. How are you feeling this time? Um, really bad. My, the second I called Jennifer, it's like my stomach just sank because she never not answered her phone. Then the investigation moves from New Canaan to Hartford. Detectives giving a detailed look at these videos of Fotis Dulos dumping trash along Albany Avenue with Michelle Draconis inside of his truck. At one point, the jury sees the defendant leaning out of that Ford Raptor. Her attorney claims she was cleaning gum off of her hand. It was a very heavy, emotionally draining day in court when the evidence pulled out of those trash cans was shown to the jury. The courtroom eerily quiet as one by one, a bloody striped shirt and bra were displayed by the prosecution. Jennifer's family and friends in the courtroom for that painful but powerful moment, saying they hope seeing this evidence puts an end to any suggestion that Jennifer is still missing and that she died a tragic death. The Traconis family also inside the courtroom each day supporting Michelle, her sister fighting back tears as she spoke with reporters about the interrogation videos shown to the jury. My sister attempted to cooperate not once, not twice, but three times with the police, saying everything, trying to assist them as best as she could. Fotis killed Jennifer. Oh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a fact. We know this. We, we need to find Jennifer. Videos of the hours and hours of grueling questions investigators asked Michelle Traconis were played in full for the jury. They were a crucial part in the state's case that Michelle was allegedly trying to stick to a pre-written timeline and that inconsistencies in her answers proved she wasn't being truthful. But her attorney argues they were not inconsistencies and that she was telling the truth the entire time. This past week, we heard extensive testimony about one of the key vehicles in this case, the red Toyota Tacoma that belonged to four group employee Pavel Gumieni. It appears prosecutors are leading up to its, one of its major witnesses who has been granted immunity in the case. And we left off with testimony about blood and trace evidence testing, but the big question mark remaining for the jury, what about DNA, uh, what was found on Albany Avenue? We do expect that testimony sometime soon. And we want to bring in my colleague, Kevin Geist, who has been at the courthouse since day one and even before that during the suppression hearings. And Kevin, you spoke with attorney John Schoenhorn about how the trial is going so far. What does he have to say? Absolutely, Shannon. Good morning. We asked defense attorney John Schoenhorn, simply put, about the state of the case. He described it simply as long. In some ways, he says he feels like he's not even defending his client, Michelle Traconis, but rather Fotis Dulos, who's dead. As I've said all along, this is really the trial of Fotis Dulos, and I'm not either keen to be defending him, nor is it my job, but uh, I think I said this the other day, in order to prove the charge, some of these charges, the state has taken upon itself the, uh, the obligation to prove that Fotis Dulos didn't just hurt his wife, didn't even cause her death, but he murdered her, that he intended to kill her. And 
you know, that's a choice they made. That's something they have to prove to this jury. And Shannon, it's worth pointing out as well that we're coming off of two days where Michelle Traconis's name has only come up once in testimony. So we'll see how this week pans out. Shannon. The jury, again, still sitting in those seats, wondering again how potentially she comes into play in all of this. Cabinet Attorney Schoenhorn repeatedly argued against testimony about irrelevant irre evidence or presumptive screening tests. But he also said he wasn't going to criticize the prosecution for the way that they're presenting the case. Why? Right, Sean Horn made it very clear that he wasn't going to criticize the court or the prosecutors for the way that this case has gone so far. But he says, if nothing else, the state is pointing out how much time, energy, and money went into investigating this case and ultimately how much time, energy, and money is going into prosecuting this case as well. All right, Kevin, so let's get back into the forensics testimony from Friday. The jury was shown another piece of physical evidence, a torn black plastic bag that was knotted and had duct tape on it. You can see retired state forensics lab examiner Anita Vilonis holding the bag in the courtroom. She says this was how she received it from the latent print department at the lab. They had cut and opened the knotted area, and she did a screening test on some reddish brown stains, which came back positive but no confirmatory test was done. Now, she took a number of swabbings of that bag and sent them off to the DNA section of the lab. So this is indeed the, the black plastic bag that I examined. As you can see, the area that I tested and collected, the reddish brown stains labeled S2 and S3 are marked on this bag with a silver marker. My initials are also within those circles. The swabbing that I took that I designated as S7 was approximately the edge of the black plastic bag, interior and exterior, as well as the black portion of the bag. So this, this top area here, the interior and exterior, would have been swabbing seven, is that correct? Yes. Along with the separate piece? Yes. Well, imagine that the bag was knotted and someone may have been handling this bag, as I imagined as I examined my evidence, that perhaps the bag was knotted and someone would be touching or carrying this bag. And that was my thought process in collecting that sample. And when it comes to forensic analysis, one of the things examiners at the lab need to do is look over every inch of an item, and sometimes that leads to finding more evidence. When Vilonis first received the garbage bag, still knotted, here is what she did. I proceeded to loosen that knot a bit so that I could swab the knot area and as well as the internal surfaces of that knot. Um, during that time, I observed a hair-like fiber that was entangled in this knot. So I removed that hair-like fiber. image once. Well, she then determined that was indeed a human hair and then sent the root of that hair to be tested for DNA. Then there was that white hard material we first learned about on Thursday, which had confirmed blood on it. We had Brian Foley, the former spokesperson for the state police commissioner, on our show on Friday. He says investigators believed it was either bone or tooth, but that it would have to be sent to the lab to confirm that. Bylona says she removed the staining and a hair-like fiber and packaged the item to be sent to another lab for more testing. That fiber was determined to not be human hair. We're still waiting to hear exactly what that white material is. Also tested was a pair of Husky gloves found in the trash dumped along Albany Avenue. By Lonis meticulously noted, marked and swabbed each blood-like stain on both gloves. Stains on each glove had a positive result in a screening test, but we didn't hear anything about confirmatory tests being done. Swabs were sent off for DNA testing. Now, Vilonis was also responsible for examining what's called trace evidence, which includes things like fibers, hair, soil, or wood. She was able to recover what appeared to be a hair from the stained towel found along Albany Avenue, and she confirmed it was a human hair. Again, without DNA testimony, though, we don't know yet whose hair it was. Vilonis explained this process. The questions I ask myself really are, 
is, is this a hair? Is this a human hair or an animal hair? If it's a human hair, do, does it have a root? And does this root have tissue-like material on the end, meaning a piece of follicle perhaps, that could be sent for nuclear DNA analysis? So Kevin, let's talk about this testimony and really overall what we've seen from the forensics experts. It appears the state is trying to prove it wasn't just the police being thorough and precise in the case. Also precise were the workers at the state lab. Right, similar to prosecutors pointing out how much time and energy was put in by state police and local investigators, they're also sort of pointing out how much time and energy went in from state forensics experts, how much time they put in, the different type of small pieces of evidence they were able to find, like hair, like fibers and other sort of fibers on some of this material, uh, how many people these uh, pieces of evidence had to go through, ultimately all funneling over to the DNA department, and ultimately we're likely going to hear a lot more testimony from a DNA expert about what some of this material ultimately was, uh, something we're expecting uh, very, very soon. All right, Kevin, on cross-examination, attorney Schoenhorn brought up concerns about the way garbage was collected by detectives along Albany Avenue, arguing cross-contamination could have happened here. I trust the submitting agency to perform their duties as they are trained, and I take in the evidence as it is presented to me. All right, so you would trust them to handle it correctly is what you're saying, right? Yes. So dumping everything from that barrel into one larger construction bag and bringing it someplace else, would that not be within the protocol as you understand it? I don't see any alternative. Would you like them to spread out uh, paper and go through this garbage can item by item on a city street? Well, I think the if I would personally also bag that, take it back to a secure location, and sort through it. Huh. But by doing that, you also agree that it would cross-contaminate any items that were in that barrel, correct? It's a barrel of garbage. So, Kevin, the forensic expert defending the work of investigators here, saying there wasn't much of an alternative, but she does say there was not cross-contamination. Right. She ultimately sort of points out that there is, there's always a chance of cross-contamination, but ultimately she seemed to be in the uh, train of thought that any DNA or anything they were able to pull off of some of this material that was collected along Albany Avenue was something that they were able to use, something that was sent to DNA experts and ultimately would be able to uh, get back to the lab uh, in a safe manner so that the results uh, were consistent with what uh, they ultimately prosecutors were looking for. I mean, it wasn't just the Albany Avenue evidence. Vilonis also handled some of the items seized from the Toyota Tacoma. That includes a hair found on the interior door panel, which was removed by investigators. She says it was indeed a human hair with a root portion, which was sent for DNA analysis. We also heard about testing done on the carpeting of the Toyota Tacoma, which was ripped out of the vehicle by investigators and sent to the forensics lab. Pylonis says she tested various areas of the carpeting and got a positive screening test on one portion. She outlined that area and sent it to the DNA unit. Now, Tacoma's seats were once again brought up on the cross-examination of retired forensic examiner Christine Roy on Friday. We heard earlier last week about the cutting taken from those seats and then sent to the lab. Attorney John Schoenhorn asked a witness from the forensics lab about what she observed on the cutting. You did not see any visible sign of any staining of any sort on it, correct? On this entire piece, no. There was none at all, right? None on either side. So if somebody had identified it as a blood-like stain, you saw nothing to support that, correct? Visually, no. With my unaided eye, no. Now, while the witness was asked about using bleach to clean her work area at the lab, Attorney McGinnis from the state brought up a car wash. That set off an intense back and forth. So if things are bleached or other cleaning products are applied or car goes through car wash, for example, that could destroy potential biological material. Is that correct? It depends on the type of cleaning agent that you're using. Sure. Yeah. Bleach being the most prevalent one that is used in forensic labs to clean. Have you ever heard of a car wash using bleach to clean a car? 
I don't know anything about car washes. Or what detergents or no. what kind of cloths they use. That's not any part of my Fair enough. knowledge. You were asked on cross-examination just now about car washes using bleach. I wanted to ask you, could vacuuming a surface potentially remove biological evidence from that surface? Your Honor, that's definitely outside the scope well, of cross. Now we're talking about what goes on at the car wash. Again, the term car wash doesn't open every door. Sustained. So at this point, the jury might be wondering, why is the term car wash being brought up? We talked about that when we first heard testimony about how the Tacoma was processed. Detectives noted how clean the vehicle looked. And we know from arrest warrants that Michelle Traconis followed Fotis Dulos to take the truck to be detailed at Russell Speeder's car wash in Avon before state police seized the vehicle. That's according to investigators. Now, Kevin, the jury has heard testimony about how cleaning products impact tests. Does it seem like bringing up the car wash is the prosecution's way of preparing the jury for that evidence potentially not being found in the Tacoma? It definitely could be. Ultimately, I think prosecutors are slowly sort of starting to bring all these puzzle pieces together for the jury. Now, we know uh, from previous testimony that Fotis Dulos was alleged to have driven that Toyota Tacoma from Farmington down to New Canaan and then back to Farmington. Uh, so we know that the Toyota Tacoma is a key piece of evidence and ultimately having it thoroughly detailed and cleaned uh, ultimately could play to the prosecutor's uh, advantage if they can prove to the jury that cleaning the Toyota Tacoma, having it detailed uh, meticulously uh, was all part of a larger cover-up. Yeah, trying to kind of get some of those answers or those questions in there for those forensics experts. Uh, Kevin Geis, we appreciate your reporting once again. Live outside Stanford Superior Court getting ready for day 17 of testimony. Kevin, we'll let you get inside and see what today holds. More to come on Inside the Trial. Michelle Draconis coming up. We'll speak once again with attorney Jim Bergen about what we've seen so far in the trial. Stay with us. Welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis. We are joined once again by attorney Jim Bergen, uh, one of our legal analysts who's been giving us his insight throughout this entire trial. Jim, we're in um, week three, three weeks plus now into the trial. Uh, the state making the case for a thorough investigation, both by investigators uh, and forensics uh, lab experts. But attorney John Schoenhorn calling the testimony long. Uh, so how does he take things uh, kind of back into possession, so to speak, when he finally gets his turn um, to, to speak to the jury? Well, I think he has to have the courage to limit himself. Uh, the temptation, it's like a shiny object, you know, is to stand up every time he sees something that doesn't make sense. And even though he's explained quite well that, you know, it's the state has to prove this murder, I think he has to resist trying to defend this murder because the murder... I think you ought to just assume it was a murder. If you assume it's a murder, he doesn't have to take anything back. You know, he's still just defending her. He's not defending Fotis. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the jury uh, may be thinking, uh, God, can we just hear from the defendant? Be nice to hear what she might have to say. I asked, of course, the, the million dollar question to attorney John Schoenhorn, one of the last times I was in court. Of course, he has said, he, you know, you gotta see how this plays out as to whether or not she takes a stand. But at this point, would it help the jury to hear from the defendant, do you think? Well, they've already heard from her. I mean, trials are for lawyers about recreating history. And here, the actual live history, when they're interrogating her, and we're watching her live, and she's talking contemporaneously. That is living history. I'm not sure what her testimony could add to that, because all she could say is, yeah, I didn't know. All right, well... You've already proven you didn't know by your conduct, and especially when you've got the prosecutor himself already admitting, not knowing he's admitting it, she doesn't know anything. And one thing we just heard again was this, this car wash term, and they almost kind of try to bring that in to the DNA forensic analyst. Uh, we know from uh, our reporting and from um, arrest warrants that there is a car wash that later comes into play in all of this. Investigators say that Michelle Traconis followed Fotis Dulos here to the car wash here to get the Toyota Tacoma uh, detailed. Um, this was all, again, uh, after about a week or so after Jennifer's disappearance. 
Um, we also know, uh, according to Attorney John Schoenhorn, that there was no confirmed blood found in that Tacoma. So how does this change the state's theory that the truck was cleaned up at the Mountain Spring property? Um, we know later on that that property even would have an excavator out at it uh, to search that property once again. But that was a key part of their case about this alleged cleanup that happened there in that property. So um, what do we make of this and where all of this is heading and finally learning that the Tacoma went to the car wash? Well, it's very revealing about FOTUS. Uh, FOTUS, of course, is not on trial. I think it's totally irrelevant to Michelle. I think Michelle's lawyer's position ought to be yeah, he cleaned the car. If she doesn't know what's going on, so he cleans the car, cleans the truck. You know, there's a lot of wealthy people who like to keep their stuff clean. And for her to think, aha, the same guy who can turn on a dime, the same guy who's presenting himself to me as this great family man and knows I love my daughter and my parents and I'll help you with your five kids, and he's going to somehow signal to her that, yeah, but on the other hand, I do kill the mother of five of them. It just, they haven't been able to focus on that because I'm not sure there's anything to focus mm -hmm. on. And the jury has yet to hear any sort of questioning from investigators on the, the taking of the Toyota Tacoma to get it detailed. So again, we go back to, you know, was there a reason? Did, did he just say, I'm going to get it clean? Can you help me drive over there, follow me over there? So it always comes back to what had photos told her or shared with her at the time. I think what this does is prove beyond a reasonable doubt what the police thought. <laughs> and, and of course, the police aren't on trial. Uh, the police did a really good job. They found everything that you could find <coughs> and the fact that he's trying to clean it up, that's really important, but that doesn't help prove that she would know. Mm -hmm. Like, why would he bring that up? It's, it's like, I don't know. It's, what we know is what the police thought and that's their job. Go get probable cause. Don't worry about what actually happened. That's for the prosecutor. That's later for a judge and a jury if you get that far. But here, they're doing their job. They ought to be applauded for doing a great job, but that doesn't actually help prove this case. Which I come back to that moment. The jury would, you know, would they want to hear from Michelle? What were you, were you under the impression of that day that you were going to the car wash? What had you been told at that point? You know, that's something I just wonder if the jury is wondering if they could, you know, hear from the defendant. Um, you know, I, I, last week, I will say, uh, we saw some, some emotion from Michelle in court once again. That was um, one of those days that we were hearing from uh, investigators on the questioning. Uh, might have been the week before last. Uh, <coughs> what is it, you know, when you're in court and you see a defendant start to tear up, does that have any sort of impact at all on a jury? Yeah, the jury is, is supposed to be studying her. Um, now, it depends on what she was reacting to. There's so many things that are upsetting here. Uh, the part that I thought was the most dramatic was her own reactions when they're telling her he killed her. And she, she, you can watch her come into grips with, my God, this guy killed her? Mm -hmm. and, and, like, she's still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Well, what can I do? I'll take you. Where do you want to go? Let's, I, I want to help. Yeah. I even got a, a very experienced lawyer, 40-plus years' experience, and he says, let's go in and talk. Let's do whatever we can do. So I, I don't think they're yet getting there. And yet there would be two more interviews filled with all kinds of questions, hours long worth of questions from Good the for show. Them. They should have done that. They did it. But now there's plenty for the jury to chew on. And I think Schoenhorn's just got to like let them see that. All right, much more to come on Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis coming up. We'll be right back with Jim after a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. We are joined once again by attorney Jim Bergen, one of our legal analysts. We are three weeks plus into this. Uh, the judge has said that this could go anywhere from six to eight weeks. So how much longer, Jim, do you expect the state to go in proving their case? They can go as long as they want if they're going to build this whole case against Fotis Dulos. It's a long, long case. I'm not sure whether it's advancing the ball against Michelle. And we talked about it's actually given Attorney John Schoenhorn ample cross-examination time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I would say a whole lot more cross-examination than he needs. And he, it's like shiny objects. He can't resist doing cross-examination when he sees things that don't make sense. I think it's a discipline for a, a defense lawyer, actually any lawyer, it's a discipline to shut up mm -hmm. and not do much. Yeah. Um, and then he's, his, his clients already carried most of the work, you know, the, most of the water in this case, so to speak. And I don't think I'd put her back up on the stand because 
the, the prosecutor then gets to cross-examine and do its whole case just by forcing all these questions. And there's really a, a downside. Now, now, prosecutors don't tend to be as great cross-examiners as they are good direct examiners because hmm. they got to put the case on. Mm -hmm. And defense lawyers, of course, become good cross-examiners because that's sometimes all they do. And there are certain things that they can bring out uh, that haven't been brought up in the cross-examination before, right? That's right. Jim, we thank you as always. Still a lot more to come. We appreciate your insight and analysis as always. That wraps up our exclusive Inside the Trial of Michelle Dracona's streaming special. You can watch the trial live on our streaming channels when court starts around 10 a.m. every day. And we will have live coverage on NBC Connecticut News at 4. Be sure to join us weekdays at 9 a.m. for more in-depth analysis as the trial continues to unfold.